those of you that have known me for more than about five years would say that's true. Yes, Daniel was one of those individuals who went by Dan at the time, and uh, you, you got to watch what you say around him. He's a very sensitive guy. And those of you that know me intimately today know that that's not true. saying, what sort of man is this that even winds and sea obey him? That's Matthew 8, 27. Excited to be with you on this Wednesday for Discipleship Conditioning. Today we're going to go through the book of Matthew, specifically chapter 8, in sequential order as we've been doing, this now being the eighth week. Discipleship Conditioning started in February of 2023. This is episode 48, 9, 50, somewhere in there. Uh, really excited that we're getting up into the 40s into the 50s, but really excited at how this podcast has evolved over time. And it's interesting. I just heard an alarm go off on another cell phone in the house, and apparently there's some sort of message that's supposed to go off around this time on all devices. And so uh, I've got all of mine shut off, so hopefully we don't get notified in that. Um, I had a colleague this morning say, you haven't heard about that? Uh, You must be living like an ostrich with your head in the sand. and I suppose that's true. I try to shut off social media and shut off the news and those sorts of things. Now, you can connect with us on social media, but I literally log on for business purposes and interaction. I actually prefer email contact much more. If you'd like to communicate, I don't want to communicate just for the sake of communicating. I want to communicate to form a relationship. And so we have our email, our new email podcast at discipleshipconditioning.com in the show notes. Uh, We have another email for our biblical anatomy podcast, which I mentioned on Monday. And please reach out with prayer requests or to say hello or uh, to let us know how we're doing, those sorts of things. Uh, you, You really don't know how much those correspondence mean, even if it's a simple email. Um, I, I'm never, I'm never, not surprised at what we bear on a daily basis and how words of affirmation can be such a good thing to people. You never know the person walking down the street, what they're going through, that they may have a sick relative, that something as simple as saying, I I like your shirt, uh, can can mean the world. Uh, Shirt is an interesting thing that uh, I'm glad I accidentally said there because It's funny, as I look back at the shorts that I've been submitting through YouTube and uh, Tic Tac and all those different things, um, the ones where I wear a light-colored shirt get more views. In fact, in some instances, the ones where I'm wearing a black shirt get zero views. I wonder why that is. But nevertheless, I'm getting off topic. Today is Matthew chapter 8, and I'm so thankful to be with you, so encouraged on this uh, this Wednesday, and I hope that this message encourages you and that you can palpate, you can feel the Holy Spirit in your life. As a reminder, our mission is to bring together Christians who strive to follow the light of God over the darkness of this world, to renew our mindsets through shared experience and discipleship so we can better love the Lord our God following his commandments. Today's story, I'm just going to take you to this morning men's group, um, as I often do. And uh, I want to make abundantly clear and translucent, if you will, my growing nature as a Christian man. I don't sit here in my office and disseminate information in the form of this podcast to let you know what to do. I really want it to serve as a discussion, and I reserve the right to be wrong. And I do not put a cap on how wrong I am or how many times I am wrong. Uh, We had a discussion this morning over communion. And it was a fantastic moment where the Holy Spirit led a brother of mine to inform that me and my other brother, there was three of us, were wrong. And that's growing in Christian favor, in Christian light. I told him my old self would have been offended by the things that he said. But my new self is not. 
You know, I'm a very sensitive person, and I used to really look down upon that. Uh, I could turn anything into an insult. And those of you that have known me for more than about five years would say that's true. Yes, Daniel was one of those individuals who went by Dan at the time, and uh, you, you got to watch what you say around him. He's a very sensitive guy. And those of you that know me intimately today know that that's not true. And I credit that to my faith. I credit that to my salvation in Jesus and the person that I have become. Inching and inching and inching, just like you, to every day live my life more by faith than anything else that this world has to offer. My daughter's uh, memorizing, do not store up your treasures in heaven where moths and vermin can destroy. Uh, Excuse me, I got that completely wrong. She would correct me if she was here. Do not store up your treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy, but do uh, store your treasures in heaven. And so that's a process that I undergo on a daily basis. As a reminder, as I like to do, not because I'm proud of it, Uh, but because I want to be authentic. If this is the first time you've listened to this, I do not edit. Uh, I got that passage wrong. And again, if my daughter was here, she would have corrected me because she knows it better than I do. Uh, And she's, for humility's sake, she's six. So uh, that tells you something. But um, I want to be authentic and genuine with the words that I say. And I want to be wrong. Not because I purposefully want to be wrong, but I want to make this as much of a live conversation as possible make you feel like in your car, uh, on your walk, wherever you are, uh, at your desk at work, wherever you may be, that this is a live conversation that we're having right now and it's not polished up and glorified and made to be anything more than it is. And that's just a discussion of Matthew chapter 8, which I've delayed enough, so let's get into it. Uh, Matthew chapter 8 verse 4 reads, And Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for proof of them. Again, this is Matthew 8, 4. I would encourage you to go back into the Old Testament, open up Leviticus, go to chapter 14 and read 1 through 32, verses 1 through 32. Um, Full disclosure, this isn't memory that I had of Leviticus. This is having an awesome study Bible that I cherish very much. Uh, if you're on video, this is the study Bible that I use. It's a ESV, and it directed me to Leviticus chapter 14, verses 1 through 8, specifically 2 through, or not 1 through 8, I'm sorry, 1 through 32. Specifically, it directed me to verses 2 through 32. Uh, but nevertheless, it was important for me to go back and spend some time this week reading that section to really understand what a leper had to go through to be reintroduced to society. Uh, There's rituals like two birds, killing one bird, placing the other bird in the blood of the deceased bird and letting that uh, bird free. It's very symbolic, isn't it? Another symbolism that occurred thereafter was placing uh, blood on the right lobe of the ear, right thumb, right big toe, and then oil in the left hand, and then fingers of the right hand were to be dipped into the oil of the left hand and sprinkled seven times. And that oil was to be used to cleanse the lobe, the right lobe of the ear from the blood that it had and the right thumb as well and the right big toe as well. Obviously lots of symbolism to what Jesus would do many years later for all of us. Which is why we don't sacrifice anymore because His sacrifice paid the sins of all in a way that uh, no animal or no other person ever could. So I I hope I provoke interest in you to go back to Leviticus chapter 14 verses 1 through 32 and read them. Because I think when you do, you're going to arrive at a similar conclusion to me on how profound it was that in this way, Jesus was announcing himself as God. Because the only explanation that they had in Leviticus was that this was a miracle, that you were healed by God through this process. So even though when we read Matthew chapter 8, we don't hear him say, I am God, if you go back to the connection of Leviticus, which he was very familiar with, he directed this leper to that specific section of scripture. It was indirectly pronouncing himself as God, in my opinion. In Matthew 8, 8, we read, But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word, and my servant will be healed. 
Now, I've read this verse many times, and I, as with all verses, my understanding changes over time and depth increases. I sort of think of the Bible and its two-dimensional text as three-dimensional text. And each time I watch it, I acquire more depth. And each time I disciple with others and I collaborate with wise counsel and I use commentary uh, from different sources, including my study Bible, it enriches how much the Bible communicates in its three-dimensional depth uh, that I experience. Of course, including prayer in that is instrumental. It's, it's more than that. It's paramount. But in reading this the last seven days, um, it is so amazing to me that someone in opposition, a Roman centurion, someone in opposition knew Jesus well enough and had faith in Jesus enough to say, you don't need to come to my house. Say the word and I know he will be healed. That is, that is so profound, so profound. And the center of this podcast is, uh, is is faith based? Um, literally, this entire podcast is faith based, but this specific chapter, the focus for me is faith and the depth of our faith. I am not worthy. I think we've all felt this way that we're not worthy. Uh, if you've had a super emotional moment in your faith where you realize you're not worthy, that is quite literal. Uh, I remember that in the summer of 2019 quite well, and many experiences uh, since then that. As I will say in our key takeaways at the end, how can we have faith like the centurion? What would it take for us to have this level of faith? To, to believe that a word can be spoken and then it'll be done. You know, we're trained in, even if we're not scientists, we're trained in our educational system to be many scientists and to only believe things that you can see. It reminds me of one of my favorite books. The saying is, uh, seeing is believing. And he mixes the words around and says, believing is seen. It's a book that uh, I, I've referenced before. And uh, if you're interested, you can find it easily on all the bookstore platforms. You can also go to um, our links page for book recommendations in the show notes and get a link to it and purchase it that way. But it's a, it's a great book. It's a super in-depth read. And I really love the way that he's flipped that statement because rather than being trained as Americans as we often are that seeing is believing oh I can I can see this flashlight and so okay well that means the flashlight's real but mixing that in a faith-based way that believing is seen believing and having faith gets you to see the world from a different point of view and gets you to see the truth to, to see things for what they truly are and it's such a 180 degree rotation from the way that our society conditions us um, you know I was talking earlier this morning to the same men's group about dark matter they say that 99.9% of the visible universe is invisible and yet we still go back to oh flashlight okay well that means it's true that means it's a flashlight um and for those of you listening to the podcast in audio form on video form i'm holding a flashlight right now um so if 99.9 percent .9 of the visible universe or what we know to exist is invisible maybe we should humble ourselves and have a little bit of faith don't you think moving on to matthew 8 11 through 12 or 11 and 12 I tell you many will come from east and west and recline at table with Adam with, excuse me with Abraham Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth from east to west what does that mean well Again, I'm no biblical scholar, but in my minimal research in the materials that I have available to me, uh, that you have available to you as well, East and West, generally it's agreed that it represents the Gentiles, which is us. Uh, basically, uh, anyone that was not a Jew at that period of time. So what does the, the sons of the kingdom represent? Well, the Jews, the children of Israel. Uh, it's, it's stated often in the New Testament that this is not a insider's club that anyone 
can have a direct relationship with God. Us Americans, which would be classified as Gentiles, included. So to say this amongst this Jewish community would have been an absolute shock to them that they, and at the least something that jolts them, perturbs them to realize that they don't inherit this just because of where they were born, or they don't inherit this just because of the land that they occupy. It is a Christian effort. It is a faith in Jesus, a active faith that is not easy day in and day out that gets you to a place of sanctification and a amazing loving relationship with the Lord. In Matthew 8, 17, it reads, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took illnesses and bore our diseases. Now, other than the obvious symbolism here of what Jesus was going to do later on in Matthew and paying the price as a sinless individual, as the only sinless individual, as a non-biblical scholar, I will just encourage you to go examine Isaiah 53, 4 and pray over the connection that that has with Matthew 8, 17. In Matthew 8, 22, it reads, And Jesus said to him, Follow me, and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Part of that that sticks out is the last part, leave the dead to bury their own dead. Whatever connotation you think of is dead. And when I first read this uh, this morning, which who knows how many times total I've read this, uh, I'm not counting, but when I read this today, again, seven days in a row, so at least the seventh time in a week reading this, I almost read the dead is living but dead in Christ. And if you read a few sentences prior or go compare it with other Gospels, it does say a basically deceased father. And so we are speaking to a person that is dead in the understanding that we would have here on earth in our physical state. But regardless, it then says dead again. So leave the dead to bury their own dead. So the first dead would symbolize those dead in Christ, those that are walking without faith, those that are oblivious to the ways of Jesus. And then the second would be a physical death to bury their own dead. But either way you look at it, the connotation at least once, um, and previously thought twice before actually figuring it out, at least once there is representing a spiritual death as opposed to a physical death. And there must be a distinction there that we have in our minds as Christians to understand the spiritual death versus the physical death. We will all experience physical death. It's just a matter of time. But we don't need to experience spiritual death if we are connected, if we are yoked with Christ. I have a, another version of the Bible here that I use far less frequently, but I enjoy very much. Um, it is called the Interlinear Bible. It takes the Hebrew and Greek and translates it to English, but it does so super literally where it takes a word and defines it as a word. Um, and so the sentences often don't make sense because of the way that it's broken down. Uh, but there it reads, to bury themselves dead, uh, which is an interesting component of it as well, indicating that spiritual death, um, that, that also there's a physical death that is experienced, but the spiritual death had already been experienced or had already occurred. In Matthew 8.32, it reads, and he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs. And behold, behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. We talked about this this morning. Uh, this is a part of Matthew 8 that didn't stick out to me as much. But it sure does after our discussion in the morning, I can tell you that. And a couple things that I didn't realize is apparently uh, pigs are notoriously good swimmers. And so to think of demons going into a herd of pigs and not only driving directly towards water, but then drowning themselves um, is, is really interesting. Pigs also have a buoyancy to them. Now, interestingly enough, based on some very minimal research I did just prior to this, most pigs actually have a lower percent body fat than most humans do, which is depressing. But the way that they're structured is in a buoyant fashion. So you think of these demons that Jesus cast out of these two men 
into this herd of pigs to go directly for water and, 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 and drown themselves when by nature pigs aren't prone to do that adds a layer of depth to it that is interesting. And even before that, a few verses before that, as the demons are speaking to Jesus, they say, uh, you're basically here early, before your time or before the time. And so fully well acknowledging that the demons know, even currently, that the earth is sort of their playground. And they better enjoy it while they can because there will be an end times where demons and the devil will be defeated. And they're announcing this, that you're here early. Are you here to torment us before the time? Um, and if there's any three words that stuck out most in Matthew chapter 8, for me it was probably those three words, which is interesting because the rest of that section with the pigs did not stand out to me as much until this morning in my discussion with my, my brothers, my peers. So, as always, I hope that this encourages you to dive deeper into this chapter. I hope that this challenges you, and I hope this is motivating to you. I do all of this with love. There is no offense intended whatsoever. I hope to encourage and inspire using examples from my life to best promote the gospel and promote the Bible as a whole so that you will seek it in a way that is specific and beneficial to your life. We're on different paths. I know that. And I truly just aim to serve as an inspiration. With that in mind, we will continue our self-sponsorship. Please go to biblicalanatomy.com. You can find everything that we're about there. Uh, also, if you scroll down to the show notes, you will see our emails that we have, specifically the one for this uh, podcast. It will direct you directly to us, so it really doesn't matter which email you use. You'll also see a link for tips and referrals. Um, both are highly appreciated. Tips are appreciated because it helps fund the things that we're doing. I've been having a problem with this microphone, and so I'll probably be purchasing one in the future. If you're looking on video and you see these zip ties, it's to keep this thing working properly. Tips directly go to um, a new microphone and those sorts of things so we can continue paying for the subscriptions we have and investing in the products that we need, the equipment that we need to keep this going. And referrals just help us continue to grow and get us in front of people that we aren't currently in front of. Uh, recognize, I hope you do, that this is super uncomfortable for me. That whole like and subscribe thing just is cringeworthy to me. I don't enjoy it. Um, but uh, I'm very thankful that if you provide a monetary tip or a referral or even a review, uh, that helps as well. Apart from that, if you go to biblicalanatomy.com, I would hope you consider attending one of our biblical anatomy courses. If you've learned biblical anatomy, or if you've learned anatomy and physiology, unfortunately, I have an announcement to make. You've learned it wrong because you did not learn it biblically. We teach it the right way. If you're interested to understand how your body works from a biblical perspective, we hope that you check that out. We have both asynchronous courses that are being loaded as we speak and also synchronous courses or cohort based courses that will start uh, most likely in the spring is when we'll have the first one uh, going. This is going to be most pertinent towards the college freshmen, but I can see homeschoolers uh, looking at this as an option as well. In fact, I'm helping with some ninth graders at the moment. Um, and I can also see this of being interest to uh, the average individual who's Christian uh, brother or sister who wants to re-examine anatomy and physiology in a way that is, is done so, I believe, properly uh, by honoring God and doing so in a biblical fashion, which is why our website is biblicalanatomy.com. So what's the take-home message? Pretty simple. What stood out most for me is, is before the time, but also that Roman centurion. So does our faith match that of the Roman centurion, someone that was in opposition of that area, the people, the Jews of that area, but yet had faith greater than just about anyone Jesus had seen at the time, as it's pronounced in Matthew. So does our faith match that of the centurion? Uh, I think that's a challenging question that we all need to examine further. And as we always do, let's conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen.